Well, good morning, everybody. Right now, we see the most beautiful sunshine, but I know that the rains are coming. So Melanie and I, next week, we're going up to our house in Granada where we get really hit hard by storms. But if we don't unblock our drains, we're going to probably lose everything that's precious to us in our house. I remember one time we were living in Nueva Andalusia and we forgot to unblock the drains. And the water came flooding into the house and all of the valuable stuff that we have in the bottom of the house was absolutely ruined. And I think it's like that with our lives. I think it's, we have to unblock our drainage system. There's things blocking us from the abundance of God. And like those drains, if we don't unblock those things in our lives, everything, every crevice, everything that we hold dear is going to suffer, is going to get ruined. Now, I love unblocking drains. I've stuck my hands in the grossest places, <laughs> toilets, drain pipes, and, you know, Melanie says, can you clean the drains, unblock the drains? So I stick my hand, you know, in it, and then I say, Melanie, look what I got. <laughs> it's just all this, like, slime and hair and everything. She says, I don't want to see it, I don't want to see it. And I've, yeah, I've stuck my hands, but there's, I, I enjoy doing it because I'm not focused on that. I'm focused on the overflow. I'm, I'm focused on the fact that the drains are going to work. I'm focusing on the fact that I'm not going to smell that terrible smell anymore. And I'm focused on the fact that, you know what, it's hard work right now. It's pretty gross, but it's necessary, especially slime. Sometimes you just got to stick your hand in there and you can't like pick up the slime. It just kind of dribbles out of your fingers and so on. But I kind of like that kind of for the vision because of the joy set before me that, you know what, if I unblock these things in my life, I'm going to have a great life. Let's just take something like shyness, for example. Shyness is a crippling blocker in your life. If you're shy, you can't be the light of the world. If you're shy, you can't share the gospel with people. If you're shy, you're always thinking, well, what are people going to think of me? So I just better stay you know, under the bed. You can't be the light of the world. So how do you unblock yourself from shyness? Imagine going around you know, for all your life just saying, I'm shy, I'm shy, and defining yourself by your blockage. And then God wants you to take that out, to unblock yourself. But imagine what your life would be like if you weren't held back by shyness. Now, the title of my message is Unblocking Our Lives for God's Abundance. Now, I don't want to come across like an American prosperity preacher. Actually, I believe there's prosperity, but it's much bigger and larger than we imagine. But I want to read some scriptures to you just to build up your faith and get us excited about what our lives could look like if we unblocked our drains. And it's all about overflowing with abundance. So God's will for us is abundance. For example, John 10, 10. But I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness, until you overflow. Think about that. What's holding you back? Are you experiencing that verse, the word of God in your life? May every one of you overflow with the grace and favor of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a, an amazing prayer. How about this? John 15, verse 11. I have told you these things that my joy and delight may be in you and that your joy and gladness may be of full measure and complete and overflowing. What does that look like? It's contagious. If somebody's filled with joy and hope and you have dinner or lunch with that person and it's contagious and you just come in feeling so bad and suddenly there's something overflowing. It's, it's wonderful. This is what our lives could look like if we unblocked ourselves. What about this? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. 
Philippians 1.9. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. Romans 5.13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is absolutely beautiful. You don't have to be a Christian to appreciate something like this. This is what God wants to do in our lives. This is what Jesus defined as ministry. I've come and give you life, in Greek, life in superabundance. That's something that we have, but unfortunately, we have these abundance blockers in our lives. And I'm going to talk about those right now. So I want to ask, are we experiencing the reality of these, what I call Bible verses, in our lives? Or is something inside of us blocking God's overflow? Now imagine you're a plumber or something and somebody says, uh, Paul, hey, would you fix Melanie's drain here, you know? And, you know, you reach in your hand and reach your hand in there and just like slime and hair and you're pulling this out and uh, etc. This is what we have to do today. This is what we have to identify, no matter how ugly it is, no matter how long it's been in there. I remember we had a, a girl saying for us, I don't know how long, and she had like lots of hair she would lose. And then I had to clean out the drain when she left. Literally, I had a hair like that. I was just like pulling out the drain like that. I love doing it. It was so fun. Just pulling it out, pulling it out, pulling it out, and flushing it down the toilet. It was so fun. And then the sink would just, oh man, just an overflow. It was absolutely uh, lovely. So I want to talk about what is blocking God's abundance in our lives. And this in Luke chapter 6, verse 44 to 45, Jesus says something that is so incredibly beautiful. He says, for each tree is known by its own fruit. Okay? We have a walnut tree. So, there's walnuts. Indeed, figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor grapes from brambles. The good man brings good things out of the good treasure of his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil treasure of his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. I'm not too worried what people say about me or what comes out of their mouths, but I am worried about the condition of the heart. And this is what Jesus, this is why the big sins in the Bible, pride, independence, jealousy, contention, um, unforgiveness, all of these are the matter of the heart. So if you look at it, most Christian discipleship material, it's like an iceberg. You know, the upper 10% of the iceberg is, do you pray? Do you study the Bible? You don't swear. You don't do this. You shouldn't do that. You have to do this as a Christian. You should dress this way. You should read this version of the Bible. You should have this theology. All of that is what everybody else can see. But very few people discuss what's below the iceberg, what you cannot see. And this is what J Jesus came to do. He came literally, like David said, to create a new heart in us. Almost like heart surgery, a new heart. So everything comes from the depths of this iceberg, our heart. And if we can change our heart, and if we can unblock our heart, everything that we desire will happen. There will be a flow of an abundance that you can't imagine. It's, it's like Jesus said. Many of us in our churches were saying, oh God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me. And we, we want God to fill us, but very few of us, we forget about the outflow of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you know, then you will have like rivers or streams of water and they will overflow from out of your life into the lives of others. So really, the question is, it's not how filled with the Holy Spirit you are. The question is, how large is your river? How clean is your river? How pure is your river? What is your river when you're at the dinner table with somebody, with treating the waiters, whatever? 
Can people swim in it? Does it smell good? Is it beautiful? Are there plants growing up alongside of it? What is the condition of the words of our mouth? What comes out of our hearts? So I want to talk about three major abundance blockers. I could name hundreds, but I've just chosen three. Number one, abundance blocker number one is a root of bitterness. And I never thought that I had a root of bitterness, but I was absolutely wrong. A few days ago, I was uh, interviewing Nicholas um, Holton on television, and he was a former bishop of Salisbury. And this man, we were talking about environmental issues. And then when we were talking about climate change and so on, people wrote in the nastiest emails and oh, and then after the program, you know, somebody kind of attacked me and accused me of something. And I just felt so bitter and angry <laughs> at people. And I just said, oh no, what's coming out of my heart, Kurt? And we always say, oh, well, I'm right. That's why I'm bitter. Because I'm right. We kind of find justifications. But there's no justification. And this bishop, Nicholas, I just called him Nick. He said, should I wear a dog collar on television? I said, no, just look ordinary. I'll call you Nick. And this guy was just so beautiful and at peace. And people were kind of like emailing him saying, well, what about this? You know, blah, 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 blah. And a lot of anger, you know, from kind of right wing or left wing or whatever it is. Thing, a lot of anger directed towards him, but he just had this smile. He just had some this 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 beautiful inner peace. And then here I am, you know, experiencing this root of bitterness and no abundance is flowing through me. I'm getting stupider as I speak. You know, it's like that slime. I can just imagine, you know, oh, that slime, Kurt, take it out. I didn't want to take it out. It was just like a, a root of bitterness was developing in me. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, spot on. It says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Wow. This is something that I experienced and kind of like was the genesis of this message. Because I felt so bad. And I was talking to my wife, I was talking to somebody else, and this kind of bitterness this anger that I had spread into other people and it was just it, it was toxic and I just was so happy that God said to me Kurt you have a root of bitterness isn't that great when somebody can show you something bad about yourself isn't that wonderful like if I can come to Yoshiko and I say oh Yoshiko I see this and this oh Pastor Kurt thank you so much I didn't know that I had a root of bitterness Woo! that's great I'm going to pull it out right now no matter how slimy it is but we have to get excited about unblocking. So I felt I was condemning myself. Oh, I have a root of bitterness. This is terrible, whatever. Then I suddenly started getting excited and saying, well, hey, just like I stick my hand in the toilet sometimes to unblock a toilet, I mean, I have to do it in my life and just snatch out that root of bitterness because it gets into you. And if you have a root of bitterness, well, first of all, let me see what somebody says. Okay. Oh yeah, okay. This is the root of bitterness test. Are you ready for this? Okay, when you take this test, think of politics in America. Think of fractions in Christianity. Think of denominational differences. Think of maybe people you don't like, okay? This is the root of bitterness test. Are you continually thinking destructive thoughts about someone? Are you happy at the misfortune of somebody? Do you wish harm upon someone? Are you always thinking up scenarios in your head about what you wish you could do to harm someone? <laughs> do you feel sick to your stomach when you see a person you don't like? Do you find yourself trying to turn others against someone you dislike? I'm from America. This is so serious. Say if I went to a conference, I always judge the maturity of a Christian group by how they treat their enemies. Always. If you're a member, even when I work on television, whatever. If you go into, we're a group of people, and they say, oh, the liberals, oh, the Democrats, oh, the Republicans, oh, the gays, oh, these people, these people, and they're not treating them with gentleness and respect, run away. 
run away because that's such a terrible tactic. When you have that root of bitterness, suddenly you join a group of people, could be a church like this, and you're taught to disrespect and despise somebody else because they think differently or they are different. And it says this in 1 Peter chapter 3, 15. This is where God got me. I got hit so hard, but I got cleaned out by this verse. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. He's Lord. Simple as that. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. I used to be in a place, even when I was on television for the first time and I got involved in my American politics, where I did not treat people with gentleness and respect. Because I would say, well, they're wrong. And I believe the right thing. And they're wrong. And I treated them, actually, with jokes. Like, for example, I remember, there's Christians who wouldn't even believe this. Like, you know, years ago, I just saw a, a poster of, like, Biden tripping. You know? And then people, Christian people, were laughing at this joke. They weren't treating him with gentleness or respect. And it's any time you're around people, and, and, and I'm saying this to myself, where we objectify somebody and where we heap scorn on somebody, the Bible says that Christ is Lord of our feelings, that we have to treat them with gentleness and respect even though we don't disagree with them. And I saw this bishop sitting there with the utmost gentleness and respect, and it was just like the Holy Spirit said, Kurt, you have to start putting this into practice right now. And I couldn't believe that I actually had this root of bitterness in me. So if you're out there and you, anything that I've said right now, you're bitter against a situation, a person, another group of people perhaps, and you're not treating it with gentleness and respect, ex-wife, ex-business partner, somebody who's left the church, and I, it, it doesn't matter, somebody who's a different orientation from you, whatever it is, do not laugh at these jokes. Do not laugh at, imagine if I started laughing at somebody I dis disagreed with. Ah, oh, this guy's theology sucks and everything, and I start heaping scorn. Imagine, I've done that. I have done that. Gentleness and respect. That's the command, and you will have so much joy. I tell you, this has taken away my joy. This is my number one thing, that I tend to be sarcastic. You know, I'll get in an argument with you, Paul, you know, and then, you know, I, I just like carried away, and sometimes I forget to treat Paul with gentleness and respect. I want to prove that I am right, you know, the word, and this is that, and this is my interpretation. And I tell you, this is my number one abundance blocker. With my relationship with Melanie, I can get a bit sarcastic. And this is what happens, you know, in America we have people call them conspiracy theories or different thoughts, and people talk about the mark of the beast. Let me just tell you, you have the mark of the beast if you don't have gentleness and respect. You have the mark of the beast on your heart if you're, if you're fearing another group. You have the mark of the beast on your heart if you're laughing and joking. And Do you know what the Bible says that you're in danger if you call someone a fool? Okay, if you judge their character, you're in danger of the fires of hell. So say if I see somebody I disagree with and I'm laughing at them, I'm scorning them, I'm telling people how bad they are and I'm calling them basically a fool, it says, Kurt Katner Burrow, you are in danger of the fires of hell. You see, this is an issue of the heart. It's not just something externally. They get a little mark. If your heart, even, for example, Book of Revelation, the Ephesian church, great doctrine. They didn't grow weary. They did basically everything right. And if you read that, they were almost like the perfect church. Everything right. But they lost their first love. And God says, basically, I'm going to remove the whole church. Because you got everything right. But guys, you just lost that that love, that gentleness, that respect for other people. You just become another hate monger little church that's not going to solve any problems. You have to be the light of the world. You have to set a Christ apart, Christ as Lord, and treat people with gentleness and respect. And they didn't do that, they lost it. 
Okay, number two. Number two, getting caught up. Is abundance blocker number two, judgmentalism. This scripture is downright scary. Matthew chapter seven, verses one to two. People ask me, well, does God still judge? You know, we read about all of that, what God did in the Old Testament, but does God still judge in the New Testament? Well, I think this really answers the question. For in the same way you judge others, okay, in any way, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, this is not just, oh, I judge that the water is hot, so I can't stick my... This, you know, there's an intelligent judging. But this is judgmentalism, where we think we're the right ones, that... You know, we're the right church. You know, we know the truth. And we just plow over other people. And we say, these poor people, thank you, God, that I'm not like them. And we judge them. And Jesus said, Kirk, if you do that, I'm going to judge you in the same measure. So technically speaking, churches should be the least judgmental places in the world. But unfortunately, they're not like that. I met a woman once, you know, and... And uh, when we were um, in the inner city, and, and she was, you know, I, I was going to church, and I said, hey, why don't you join us? And she said, ah, oh, you know, I already feel, you know, bad about myself. Uh, why would I want to go to church? You know, so, so somehow we're, we're associated with, like, this judgmentalism. And then Jesus says it so beautifully in Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 to 5. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. This is, this is amazing. I mean, we, we don't. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye, you hypocrite, which you bad actor, basically. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. See, we need to deplankify ourselves. I've used that expression before, I've just invented that word. To be able to see and spend more time saying, God, what are the planks? Look, when I found out that I had that root of bitterness in me, it shocked me to the core. And I had to spend a lot of time in prayer and reflection so I could take that out of me because I saw how it was blocking my life, and I saw how it was kind of ruining other people's day when I with them, when with them, a root of bitterness. When you're bitter and you're judgmental like that, it is a terrible thing. And it's much easier to reach your hand down a toilet that's overflowing with the wrong stuff than to take bitterness or something out of your own life. Deplankifying yourself, if you can even see it. Because most of us, we have these blind spots. We don't even know it. We're so busy justifying and we're like this and I'm shy and I'm like this because of this and then Jesus is just saying the Spirit of God is saying no deplankify yourself take it out then it says once you've taken it out you can help people there will be an overflow you can be with people you've kind of earned the right in a sense to be with people because you've been there and done that you've taken it out as well so let's get excited about unblocking our drains today uh, really, if we could take this out of our lives, bam, we would be different. How do you, what's an action step that we could take? And this is in Luke chapter 6, verses 36 to 38. Now today, I really want the word, the power of the word to be able to set us free. So even when I'm reading this thing, it's just, I get goosebumps. And it says this, be merciful, just as your father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, the surprising thing is, he's not talking about tithes and offerings or money here. I never, I've never seen this before. He is talking about a law of disproportionate uh, return. Jesus said if we give, then basically he'll, he will outgive us in such a spectacular manner that it's just going to overflow. 
But what is he talking about? He's not talking about money. If I reread this passage, I would read it like this. Give mercy, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. Okay? Give a lack of judgmentalism. Show compassion, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. Okay? Last one. Give a lack of condemnation, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. You know, Pope Francis, he said a, a wonderful statement that, that I love. He said, Lord, forgive me if I have forgiven people too much. But you are the one who gave me the bad example. And the bad example is, how many times should I forgive somebody? And then Jesus says, seven times 70. So this is a new way. If we show a lack of judgmentalism, I'm not talking about being a smart judge. That, that's a different thing. If we show a lack of condemnation, a lack of anger towards people, a lack of saying, oh, that person deserved that, or... You know, if you don't like a particular political party, ah, oh, the Republic, ah, oh, the Dem they they deserve that because they're voting for this or that or that. You know, any of that kind of nonsense where we engage in this bitterness and this judgmentalism and we're condemning people. Jesus said if there's an absence of that, if you're not doing that, if you're showing compassion and understanding to people, and you know what? I don't like this guy, but what's his story? Why is he saying this? And understanding. If you do that, you will unblock yourself so spectacularly. Those drains will be flowing. There will be an overflow. There will be an abundance in your life. Number three, abundance blocker number three, self-righteousness, lack of humility. Nobody wants to confess that they're self-righteous. <laughs> you know, like if I say, oh, uh, I think you're self-righteous. How dare you tell me that? Do you know, you know, that, but you're self-righteous. <laughs> that just an act. You know, it, it, you can always tell someone's maturity, you know, if you, if you try to offend them. And if they're very easily offendable and highly sensitive or something, something's going on. Like I gave a message um, ages ago about, uh, you know, isn't it beautiful if you get offended by someone? Because behind that offense means something's gone wrong. There's a blockage in your own life. You know, but, you know, this person said this about me. It's just a waste of time to do that. You've got to unblock being easily offensible. And if somebody does offend you, you should say, thank God, God, I thank you that I was offended. It really hurts. I think that I'm right. This person was wrong. But show me, God, why? Why this triggers me so much? You know, why does this trigger? What's the root? Is there a root of bitterness in me? And then you unblock that drain and your whole life changes. And by the way, not only your life changes, but the lives of people around you change. Okay, so the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee, Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. I, I just love this. Okay, this is like a trick. Some of you know this trick, but you'll see. To some who were confident of their own righteousness, okay? You'd be a part of a church. We're good at that. We have the right doctrine, everything, and looked down on everyone else. Never join a group that looks down on other people. Eh? Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Okay, like the saint and the worst possible man in uh, Jewish society. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. I've, I've said this so many times. <laughs> Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. How many of us have thought, actually, that we're better than somebody because of something? Don't you know what this guy did? Oh yeah, don't you know what he believes? And we, we think this all the time. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified, justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. 
insult ourselves all the time. Look at my teaching, oh, this or that. <laughs> we insult ourselves all the time, you know, at the expense of other people. But we can't exalt ourselves. We can take pride in, you know, what God has done in us and so on. But when we start exalting ourselves at the expense of the other people, the other people that are not right, and then we're showing contempt towards them, that's something. Then we will be judged. We will be so blocked if we're like this. Friends, I've been there. I've done that. I still do it. I still feel these blockages. It sucks. It's, it's terrible. It's just like, oh, it's terrible. But I'm excited about getting it out and the overflow. Okay. So warning light number one, or just one warning light, a contemptuous view of others. When it says you call somebody a fool and you're, you're in danger of the fires of hell itself. So if you take the Bible literally, that's, well, I mean, maybe none of you have called anybody a fool out here. Maybe you've never judged another person before, but this is pretty, pretty dangerous. So do I compare myself with others and look down on those who do not live as I do? Now, okay, who got angry at that Pharisee that said, thank you, God, that I'm not like that God? I did. And you know what I did? First thing I did, I said, thank you, God, that I'm not like that Pharisee. <laughs> no, I'm honestly, I just did it right now. Thank you that I'm not legalistic like that. Thank you that I'm a part of a church, you know, who has pretty, you know, decent doctrine or whatever, you know. And, but literally, I looked down, I said, thank you, God, that I'm not like that Pharisee. I'm exactly like that Pharisee. I have a huge plank in me. And I'm trying to, like, remove the, the little speck in the Pharisee when I have this huge plank of judgmentalism in me. And th these are big sins for Jesus. Big, 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 serious sins. We like to take smaller sins and say, well, I don't do that, you know, I don't like these people, that people, but these are big things that I suffer with, that I have to get out of my life, that are blocking my, even when I'm with uh, Melanie sometimes, we have a beautiful romantic time, and then I say something stupid. I judge her at something, something stupid, and it just interrupts the flow, and there's no abundance. There's just a half an hour or more of arguing, and then she has a bad feeling about me, and then I then I've condemned myself, and and, and you know, these are, this is so true. We have to unblock the things that are holding us back, and humble ourselves. I love Thomas Merton. He said this. He said, "Pride makes us artificial, and humility makes us real." Like this Pharisee, if we hold on to we are right, we're proud. We're better than other people. We have the solution. You might. But if you do that, you're going to be artificial and you're not going to be real. Think about it. Pride says, I know everything. I don't need to change. You know, my doctrine, my way of life, whatever. It's okay. It's not, it's not going to change because this is the truth. Okay? But if you're humble, you're saying, like Paul was, I know in part, I speak in part. There's people today that seem to know more than the Apostle Paul. <laughs> you know? But it's humility makes room for more in your life. Humility allows you to see your blind spots. Pride blocks everything. And you will never, ever, ever have. That's why Satan fell out of heaven. Pride. And if we have this pride, which I've had before, it is terrible. And... I'll read this, another quote from Thomas Merton. In humility is the greatest freedom. As long as you have to defend this imaginary self that you think is important, you lose your peace of heart. As soon as you compare that shadow with the shadows of the other people, you lose all joy because you've began to trade in unrealities, the metaverse. And there is no joy in things that do not exist. This is what the Bible tells us. Paul prayed that I would deliver the word in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to end with this verse. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing by, in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, 
not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ, who being God, humbled himself, took the form of a servant. This is telling us, literally, that if we see somebody that we don't like, the word of God tells me, a brother, a Christian brother, that I don't like, I don't agree with him, okay? It says that I have to value that person more than myself. But God, what he's saying is not true, you know? But God, he's a Republican. But God, he's a Democrat. But God, he voted for Brexit. <laughs> but God, and, and we always want to put these like qualifiers on it, but it says to me, it's speaking of differences, that I have to consider someone better than myself. Isn't it interesting? And look out to the, to not to my interests. Say if I'm a pastor of a church, we have this doctrine, we're like this. Imagine if I just, you know, said, oh, you guys got to believe all of this. I mean, that's insane. You know, God has to reveal it into your hearts. I'm not going to tell you exactly how to interpret something. or I'm not going to do that at the expense. I'm not, I'm not that, you know, <laughs> full of pride or whatever I want to say. You know, you have to hear from God. But it's something the Word of God says that I have to value Ugo above myself. And Lord Jesus, I'm going to end here. This is a time where when our drains are working, we forget about our drains, just like they've been there the whole time that we've had a house. And suddenly, the rains come. And suddenly, our entire house is flooded. And suddenly, everything we hold dear, family photos, you name it, mold, drenched, ruin, swept away by the floods, just because, in this case, we did not clean our drains. Holy Spirit, help us to identify those planks, those blind spots, maybe that self-righteousness, like I'm right, we're right, the others aren't, and thank you God that I'm not like them, thank you that we have the truth, Lord, thank you that we know what political party, thank you that we know what to believe, we know what the true agenda of the whatever some secret society is, and and uh, this pride, it, it just absolutely stinks. And when people are with me sometimes, when I've had this root of bitterness, God, forgive me. Forgive me for infecting them with bitterness and sarcasm and, and unrighteousness. It just really stinks. And I just want to reach my hand down my throat, you know, to my heart, and just unblock all of those things. I would like everybody to stand up now. And... You know, I want to do a prayer because I could ask people if you feel blocked in any way. I come up here for prayer, but we're all human beings. <laughs> we're all guilty of most of these things that I've talked about. If you feel especially blocked about something and you want to see us throughout the week, Melanie or I, just let us know. We'll be happy to, to see you and stand with you and that, you know, to deblockify yourself. But right now, Lord Jesus. I've read a lot of scripture, a lot of words that come directly from the heart of God. They're hard hitting, but they're great plumbers, aren't they? They go down to the, the root problem. They get all that slime, all that ugly stuff that I can even today think of the smell and what I've put my hands into in order to unblock a drain. It's, it's going to be kind of like that. It's going to be messy. But Lord, the end result is joy. The end result is peace. An uh, uh, end result is a new heart. An uh, end result is that people will want to be around us. Not like we're just full of gripes and groans all the time, but we're people that really impart life, that the Holy Spirit is flowing, that river is coming out, bringing life to people. This is what we want to be. And if there's anything that's blocking you right now, and, and you can just name it in your mind, praise God. Or if you can't, then ask God to reveal it to you. And I promise you, he will. That's one, that's one prayer he answers. But he'll reveal it to you so you can take it out. And don't justify it. Don't say, oh, I can't do this. This is me, my identity. Just get your hand down there in the grime and, and, and the Holy Spirit will help you. So Lord Jesus, just as we're standing right now, I pray for the power of the Word of God 
every scripture that I've read right now, Lord, that it would penetrate our hearts so effectively, so wonderfully, Lord, that we would be like that tree planted by streams of water, bearing crops throughout every season, always fed, always growing, always beautiful to taste, always beautiful to, to, to look at. These are the type of people we want to be, Lord, where we overflow and have that abundant life. But these abundance blockers, they're in all of us. Lord, help us gently. I, don't, I, I use that word gently to identify these things and just give them up to you. So for everyone right now, I just pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit in you right now, giving you the courage, showing you what you have to get rid of, showing you what your life would look like if you're free and you're unblocked. Lord, just do a wonderful work of unblocking right now in the name of Egypt in, in Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Lord, unblock, unblock, unblock. Help us to cooperate with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Woo, Jackie, yeah. No, say a prayer for what people? Come up here. Come up here. People, don't be the men that have died years ago. The men have died, yes. Let's do that. Melanie. Melanie was going to say a prayer. Okay. Usually we have like a minute of silence. But Paul, why don't you come up and pray for people who have fought in wars all over the world? And, you know, it's a remembrance day, it's a tradition that we have. But I just see wars and. Paul has been, I asked Paul, because he's been in wars. He's been in situations where it's terrible. I mean, you've almost died a, a couple of times in the midst of wars, be it in Tigray, be it in wherever. So just pray for those people that have sacrificed their lives on both sides. Wow. Four sides. <clears throat> wow. Heavenly Father, we come before you now, Lord. And we lift up all of the family members who have lost people to wars, Lord. And we just want to honor every single person who has stepped out onto that field to protect their country, to protect their family, Father. And Lord, you said that there is no bigger love than a man lay down his own life for his brother. Amen. And Lord, we just want to honor those men and women who go out onto the war field, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the bravery that you put inside of their hearts. We thank you for the courage that you gave them, Lord, to step out onto that field, Father. And Lord, we know that you are sovereign over everything. We know that your providence reigns over all, and there isn't anything that is outside of your control, Father. As we look back throughout the whole of history, Lord, we can see your hand in these wars, and we know that our strength and our faith and our confidence is in you, Father. It's not in rulers, it's not in presidents, it's not in any of these other people who are making big decisions, Lord. We put our confidence in you, Father. And we know that we, you have allowed these people to be in these positions, Father. People who are encouraging war, encouraging nuclear weapons to be used, Father. And we just pray, Lord, that you bring an end to this. We pray that you bring an end to war. And more importantly, Father, we pray that your will be done through all of this. For the men and women that have gone out onto that field, Father, if they don't know you, we pray, Lord, that they get to know who you are, Amen. the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Amen. The one that came, fully God, fully human, walked this perfect, sinless life that we couldn't, that you would die on that cross, and that through our faith in what you did on that cross, we have eternal life. Amen. And I pray, Lord, that you touch people's hearts to open their hearts to the truth of the gospel. We pray, Lord, that you bring peace to every single person who has lost a loved one on that battlefield. Amen. And we pray, Father, that you just bring what only you can bring to those people, knowing that you have conquered death, that what we see here on earth isn't the end of it knowing that you have made a way for eternal life with you, Father. Yes, thank you, Lord. So, Lord, we just glorify your great name today. We look yes. to you, Father, as the creator of the heavens and the earth, knowing that nothing is outside of your control. Mm -hmm. And we pray your will be done and healing come to every single person that has lost a loved one on that war field. 
in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. And remember, we have a walk. I think the weather is going to be good um, next Saturday. We'll meet at Laguna Village. And it's a nice, gentle walk. And you can even swim if you want, because I will be doing that. And then we can have lunch later, or you can return early if you can't do it. But hope to see you there. Bye. Bye.